So the reading tonight comes from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 45. Uh, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be the son of the, he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has been conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her, who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord shall come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Thank you, Adam, for reading. Hey, and we, I said uh, before, we have uh, a guest preacher who's actually not a guest. Uh, uh, Scott Nordstrom is a guy who's been in our church for uh, a long time, almost since the very beginning. If you want to hear a fun story on how God confirmed that uh, he and his wife were called here, ask them, because within like a couple minutes of when they walked in the door, God did something crazy. So ask him sometime. But Scott and Debbie have been active in ministry in the Omaha area for decades and decades, and he has served in an eldership and kind of a lay pastor role in other churches for well over 20 years, and he loves the word. He loves people and he served our church well in many different capacities. A lot of you probably know him, but this is the first time ever he's getting to preach on a Sunday in our church. And so I want to invite up Scott, and I want you guys to give him a warm providence. Home welcome. All right, well, good evening. This is going to be the second message in our Advent series of hope, joy, peace, and love. And tonight we're going to look at joy as we discussed. So let's define joy. If we're going to jump into joy, how would we define joy? And I'd kind of boil it down to this. Joy is great delight caused by something. So it could be an event. It could be an activity. It could be a thing. So great delight, delight caused by something or someone. It could be a person. Exceptionally good, greatly valued, or deeply appreciated. So great delight, delight caused by something or someone exceptionally good, greatly valued, or deeply appreciated. Okay, so taking that as our definition, what would you say, and just think this in your head, what would be one of your greatest joys of your life so far? Using that as your definition, the most impactful event, maybe the top one or two or three, and just take a second or two to process that a little bit. What would be one of your great joys in your life that you've experienced already? So log that in your head. We're going to come back to that at the end of the message and elaborate on that a little bit. So for me, salvation, number one, without a doubt. In my journey with Christ, in that relationship, Christ is exceptionally good, greatly valued, and deeply appreciated. He's my great delight. Number two is my marriage to my best friend over 38 years. Right? Woo! 
Thank the Lord for that, right? My wife, Debbie. And number three is my children, would be one of my great delights as well. And I don't know how many have been in the labor delivery room when you've seen a child born. I mean, that is one of the neatest experiences when you see a, a life from the womb come into to the world. And our text tonight is really going to touch on all three of those joys that are really I've experienced. And one is going to be an older married couple and a younger, soon-to-be-married couple, so marriage, children in the womb, we got John and Jesus we're going to talk about, and then salvation, Jesus who saves us from our sins. We're going to look at that a little bit as well. So contextually in our portion, the last prophets have spoken almost 400 years ago, so the Old Testament to the New Testament, God has been silent for a long, long time. And the people are longing for the Messiah to come. And they're, they're longing for this moment that we're kind of experiencing here in the next two or three or four weeks, eventually to the birth of Christ. They're longing for that. The Old Testament is pointing to the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in, and in I guess, three weeks, we're going to talk about the Christmas story in the birth of Christ. And to me, that was one of the greatest joy announcements that God has ever made to the world, that the Savior is born. And so I'm looking forward to that in that day as well and we, in a couple weeks. And so this evening, two couples that are brought into Jesus' story, and we're going to look at their emotions and their reactions and how we're part of that story as well. <clears throat> and so we're going to break down the, the section tonight in two parts. If I was going to give it a title, <clears throat> Finding Joy in Jesus. And so two parts, Too Good to Be True, and we're going to look at Joseph and Zechariah. We're going to back up a little bit and grab him into the story as well. Their reactions... And then the joy of encountering Jesus. So we're going to look at it in those two parts. And so with that, let me pray that the Lord really help us and to take all this in. Our Father, I stand up here really as uh, a weak person looking to exchange my weakness for your strength. And I have a bunch of words on paper here that need to be filled with your spirit. And so I just pray you would sort all that out and that you would impact every life here tonight. That you would change lives and that, Father, we would experience the joy of Jesus, encountering Jesus and walking with Jesus. And so give me help just to open up the scriptures and that you would be glorified, your son lifted up, and people drawn to him. And so I, I pray this in the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So we're going to start with Zechariah and Elizabeth. Now, their main text is just prior to what was read, but they were interwoven into the text uh, that was read tonight. They're an older couple. They're going to have a miracle child. Scholars think Elizabeth is probably in her 60s or 70s. So how many six-year-olds have you seen pregnant, right? That would be quite an amazing sight. I guess it does happen. I think I Googled it, and I believe it has happened, but very unusual. And so we're going to look at them, and they're going to have a miracle child named John. A lot of us know him as John the Baptist, and he would be the one to... Uh, proclaimed the Messiah is coming. So he had a very important role in Jesus' relationship. And so we're going to look at them, and we're going to start with them and the miracle child. So let's look at next slide. We're going to jump into the, the text there. So Zechariah, he's faithfully serving the Lord. Again, they're up in their 60s or 70s, and they are both righteous before God. This is the Elizabeth and Zechariah. This is the context there walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord, but they have no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. And so if you wanted a model couple to follow and pattern your life after, Zechariah and Elizabeth was it. They were faithfully serving the Lord in every way, but they had one heartache. They didn't have a child. And by now, they're well, well past the childbearing years and my hunch is they stopped praying for a child. And I was thinking of delayed answer to prayer that I would think when, when you want a child and you're not able to have a child, you just don't pray for one day, for one week. I'm, I'm sure they prayed for years for a child and no child came. And my hunch is that they, that childbearing years st passed and maybe they stopped praying. And she now carries Elizabeth, who is barren. You know, say there's five Elizabeths in the room, and you're talking, which Elizabeth are you talking about? Oh, Elizabeth, who is barren. I mean, that's a pretty tough nickname to carry 
being childless. And that would be very hard to be in that situation. And so they wanted a child so badly, that window has closed. And it's almost like they feel they might as well stop praying because it's too late. Let me go to the next slide. And they're, in their prayers, I don't know, in context doesn't tell us if they stopped praying, but almost as if they prayed and then they stopped. So Gabriel shows up. And this is, he says, your prayers answer. Now, for those who don't know Gabriel, he's an angel sent by God to declare this message to Zechariah. He's in the temple serving. And Gabriel says, Zechariah, your prayer is heard. So that context tells me that they have been praying for a child. And at this point, they probably stopped praying contextually. kind of indicates that. And your wife Elizabeth will, be, will bear a son, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. I mean, your wife will finally be pregnant after all these years, and not only that will bring joy to you, but it will bring joy to many around you. And Zechariah's response for this is, how shall I know this? I am an old man. So contextually, it's like that window. I mean, Elizabeth's baby clock, you know, bearing years, that stopped a long time ago. My wife is advanced in years who is also called barren. I mean, he doubted that message because it's like, you know what? It's too late. It's not going to happen. And I thought of a delayed answer to prayer when he's, he's saying, it's too good to be true, Gabriel, what you're telling me. It's, it's way, way, way too late. As if God can't do the impossible, right? As if God can't do the impossible. We'll go to the next slide. So here's how I picture Zechariah. And Elizabeth, persevering prayer, the window of human possibility, that first line there. They're praying hard. And I almost wonder when she was past the childbearing years, where it became humanly impossible, you stop praying, right? Sometimes that's kind of my nature. You just stop praying. And it's this scripture, with God, nothing shall be impossible. This scripture is found within this context so they stop praying as if God can't do the impossible. And we know he can. And he says, with God, nothing shall be impossible. But I thought of us sometimes, how we can get discouraged. We can pray and we pray and we pray and there's, there's silence. And you can be discouraged and you wonder, is God ever going to answer my prayer? Does God really care? And what was neat about this portion, that God performs the humanly impossible and answers prayer. Yeah, it was way past the years what they expected, but God came in and did a wonderful story. And now Elizabeth will be pregnant with a miracle child. And it just encouraged me to keep praying even when that humanly impossible window is part of our life. You pray and you pray and you pray because with God, nothing is impossible. And so we just got to keep persevering in prayer. And just an important side note to me, like I say, they're, they're probably way past the childbearing years, maybe in their 60s or 70s, and Zechariah is still found persevering in the things of the Lord. He's still serving the temple. He didn't get bitter at God. He didn't say, forget it, I'm doing my own thing. God didn't answer my prayer. And for those in this room that have longed for a child, if you know people who have longed for a child, that is a hard, hard road that they want a child so badly, and if it doesn't happen. But in this case, they kept serving, they kept persevering. And so to me, that was encouraging that they stayed the course and trusted God for whatever was brought into their life. And with God, nothing shall be impossible. So the good news is all things are possible with God. And, and even though Zechariah, in my mind, thought, you know what, Gabriel, you're a little too late. With, with God, he's never too late, right? With, all, with God, all things are possible. All right, so let's jump to Joseph and Mary. They're also going to have a miracle child. Now, the word betrothed, I mean, that's kind of a hard word to maybe understand. What does it mean to be betrothed? It's, a, it's kind of like engagement. We have several couples here engaged, right? It's a very exciting time in life. Now, back then, this word betrothed means you are legally pledged to be married. You, you have to, in order to break that engagement back then, the betrothal period, you actually had to give a certificate of divorce. I mean, that's the extent. And you actually were called husband and wife, as we'll see in some scriptures here. But you were not inv- enjoying the uh, intimacy, physical intimacy of that. And so if you were to remain chaste and pure, and any unfaithfulness was adultery. And so for Mary 
to be pregnant was impossible because she's a virgin. Joseph and Mary are staying pure in the relationship, no uh, sexual interaction. There's no way for her to be pregnant. And then, then, lo and behold, she becomes pregnant. And so, now you got to put yourself in this situation. So Gabriel, again, the messenger of God, shows up. But Joseph is not part of this baby announcement. It's just Mary and Gabriel. And Gabriel shows up to Mary and says, you're going to conceive in the womb and bear a son. And it's not going to just be any child. It's going to be the son of the Most High, given a throne to reign over his kingdom that has no end. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The child born to you will be called Holy, the Son of God. And so this dialogue goes on, and Mary's probably trying to take it in. It's like, hey, I'm a virgin. I don't know anybody. How, how is this going to happen? It's just going to be a miracle of God. And so she believes God, believes Gabriel the angel, and, and Mary becomes pregnant by an act of God. Okay, so now, how does Mary download this to Joseph to, in a way that Joseph's going to believe this? I mean, that to me is a hard sell for Joseph. And so too good to be true. In my mind, Joseph says, I'm not convinced. We're going to look at a scripture here in a little bit about that. But So we're not given that conversation that Mary had with Joseph, but we are given Joseph's reaction. And I kind of picture it this way with, with Mary. It's like, okay, Joseph, okay, you're not going to believe this. And it's going to be a really hard story, but Gabriel shows up. Now, Gabriel, is, he's an angel. He's not a dude. Gabriel shows up, and he, he tells me this unbelievable story. But you've got to believe me, Joseph. He says, I'm going to conceive in my womb and bear a son, whose name will be Jesus. He will be called the Son of the Most High. He'll be given the throne of David, and the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And the holy power of the Most High will overshadow you. The child born will be called Holy, Son of God. It's like, Joseph... I'm pregnant with a long-awaited Messiah. Now, that would be a hard sell, right? I mean, how many, you have the T-shirts, pregnant with the Messiah, right? They say you're crazy, right? And so here, here is Joseph, and we can jump to the next slide. This is the portion back, well, before, okay, so painful decision. What does Joseph do? A painful decision, okay, he hears this news, How's he going to react to it? What do, you, what do you do when life throws at you some major curveballs, and how do you react to that? And we're going to see how God was part of that process. Okay, so we'll jump to the next slide. This portion is found in Matthew. So it kind of reveals Joseph's response to whatever that story was. I don't know, like I say, I made that up as far as that interaction. But whatever that story was, Joseph took takeaway was, Mary's pregnant. I'm not the father. What do I do? And so her husband, Joseph, again, this betrothal period that was a little more than an engagement period. Her husband, Joseph, being a just man, unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. So as far as, this would be a heart-wrenching decision for Joseph. I mean, if you're engaged, all of a sudden you've got to call the marriage off. That is a hard, hard moment and a hard decision to make. And I just kind of felt for Joseph here as he had to wrestle through what does he do. And, and it's, it's pretty cool that Joseph, being a righteous man, you know, I'm not going to shame her. I'm going to divorce her quietly. The marriage is off. And that would be, like I said, just be a heart-wrenching decision. And sometimes we go through those difficult situations too. And I was thinking of Joseph. I appreciate Joseph's maturity in all this and that Joseph was going down one direction and God says, wait, wait, I'm gonna, this is, it's true what Mary's saying. He's willing to change his mind because God came in and directed him differently. And he was willing to follow and allow God to write that story. And so let's jump to the next slide here. So in this portion that in Matthew, Joseph is given a little more glimpse of just this person, Jesus, his baby. And it says, his name will be Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And so it opens up a little bigger picture for Joseph. He doesn't probably really know all the parts and pieces of what that's going to look like, but it hints at the Messiah is coming and the Savior is coming, and he's going to be one who saves us from their sins. And so let's jump back to, oh, we'll go to the next slide here on the, you know, the relationship. Again, again I appreciate Joseph because he had to wrestle with the marriage is over, and that would be so painful to go through. And as he's sitting there thinking through, God shows up and he says, no, Joseph, 
Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. So I appreciate Joseph's maturity. He was totally did a 180. What he was going to do in his own reasoning, God says, nope, it's true. Stay the course. And so sometimes when we have difficult decisions and we don't know what to do, sometimes we fall back on human reasoning. It's great to maybe consult our godly friends and allow God to be part of that process. And sometimes I forget to do that, and, and that's so helpful. So Joseph changes course here. I just want to touch on relationships in just a little bit, or just for just a minute. Relationships can be the greatest blessing in life, good, healthy relationships. And also, some bad relationships can be just a disaster and, and painful experiences. Now, they can either make you a better person, or they can make you... Uh, uh, struggle with life and take you down a path that you don't want to go down. I mean, Joseph is willing to end the marriage, and God says, stay the course. And so sometimes in our decisions, we may say, God, I think I'm going to stop having this relationship. And God may say, no, stay the course. You're going to see what I'm going to do here. But then sometimes, sometimes we have bad relationships, and we want to stay the course, and God may say, hey, give some space. And so I just want us to be exercised about healthy relationships, what that looks like, If, even in my BC days, before Christ days, evaluate our friendships. We, yes, we want to win them to the Lord, but be careful that we don't get sucked in so far that we're going down paths that we don't want to go down, that we want healthy relationships, and God can help us navigate our friendships and relationships. So I just encourage you to be exercised before the Lord, just like Joseph with this relationship. It's like, what do you do? And God will help us, like I say, navigate through that. So initially, Joseph's divorce, and God changes his mind. It's like the marriage is on. And so that's pretty exciting for me that Joseph was going to pursue even something totally different than the direction he was going to go down, and God showed up. All right, so let's talk about the joy of encountering Jesus. So Mary's pregnant. John meets Jesus. Okay, now this is pretty cool too. So John, Elizabeth is married, are pregnant about six months Mary's about one month, so she's not even showing. But she, uh, the, the angel Gabriel says, hey, your relative, we don't know if it's an aunt or a cousin, is pregnant as well with a miracle child. And so Mary, with haste, it says, she books it up to see Elizabeth. And so, like I say, Mary's probably about one month old or month, month, one month along. Elizabeth maybe six or seven months along. And so what is so neat about this, it says, as soon as Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary... She's filled with the Spirit. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? When the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby leaped for what? Joy. In the womb, the baby, one of the first recorded encounters with Jesus, the baby is leaping for joy. So I was thinking, if you want to encounter joy or experience joy, encounter Jesus. And I don't know what it feels like for a baby to leap in the womb. I can tell you it's probably easier to leap outside of the womb than in the womb. But the baby leaps for joy in the womb. It's not a fetus, not a, a tissue mass. It is a baby. It's a life leaping for joy. And they, they can't even see each other. But John is, is excited to meet Jesus in the womb. And Elizabeth is like, she's just obviously filled with the Holy Spirit, it says, and she understands that she, her relative, Mary, is carrying the Messiah, and the baby leaps for joy. And so, if you want to leap for joy, encounter Jesus, right? Encounter Jesus. And I'm not sure what that feels like. My wife, we've had four kids, and, and you, when, you can sometimes see a leg kick, and you know, you can see the arms. And it's really neat to experience that. But for a baby to leap for joy, you know, how do you do that in the womb, right? But Elizabeth felt that. And his presence... I think of Psalm 16, and his presence is fullness of joy. And so if we want joy, get into the presence of the Lord, and he brings you joy. And so just, and I've really been enjoying, no pun intended, the, the year reading through the Bible. And I, when they initially kicked that off, I'm like, when, I, I felt like I'm doing a sprint every time to get through these every day, every day, every day. But it has been really enjoyable, literally. And so I've really encouraged, I was really encouraged by that. Okay, so I want to share just two stories. Oop, there we go. Two joy, the joy of encountering Jesus. I want to share two contrasting stories, but mo both need Jesus. And that, that is me on the right. Isn't that the cutest little kid you've ever seen, right? 
Anyway, we'll get to him in a minute. But just, I was thinking of the babies in the womb, contrasting stories. So we have several friends that have committed abortions. And uh, one lady, three abortions later, now a Christian, and she realizes that she took the life of our three unborn kids. And that's pretty sobering when you come to that reality, you know. And even when on unsafe days, you're convinced, no, no, that's not true, that's not true, that's not a life. So you came to that pretty sobering reality. And she decides to give a name to each of these kids so she can mourn the loss of that child. And through that, she finds forgiveness and healing through Jesus Christ, who saves us from our sins. Praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for that. And, you know, life can be filled with many poor decisions and consequences, and as a result, there's a lot of sorrow associated and guilt with those consequences and those decisions. But praise the Lord that God can extend grace, and he can turn our sorrow to what? To joy. And in her, with her, she finds forgiveness and healing through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm so thankful for the grace of our Savior, Jesus, who saves us from our sins. And then there's my story. <clears throat> I mean, look, so you look at that. I mean, that is who I am. I'm like, I would never hurt anybody. I was the best kid. I was a good kid. I never wanted to do any wrong. And I remember in third grade, I, somewhere around third grade, I've come walking home from elementary school, about four blocks walk. And I thought, you know, I'm going to be a bad kid today. And I don't know what a bad kid looks like, but I'm going to say, I'm going to be a bad kid. I'm walking home, and I I see this adult up by his garage door, and I give him the finger. I'm walking by like this, I'm giving him the finger. And I don't know if he saw me or not, and I didn't look at him, but I'm walking by giving him the finger. And then I go home, I change my clothes, going to play with some uh, neighborhood friends, and I'm doing this conversational cussing. And the the kid's like, he's never heard me. He was like speechless. He didn't know what to think. And my season of being a bad kid lasted for about two hours. I have never given anybody a finger since. Praise the Lord for that. And I have not cussed since. Not to, but here was the struggle with me. I was a self-righteous kid, and I needed to see Jesus just as badly as someone who committed three abortions. And I really wrestled with that because it wasn't until I was 15. I grew up at Christ Community Church, which was back then Omaha Gospel Tabernacle, a Bible-believing church. But no one ever challenged me spiritually about where I was as far as my salvation goes. And when I was 15, I started taking an interest in a girl, and I had to meet the father, and I met Mr. Fear. His last name, F-E-A-R. Mr. Fear, and yes, it was a little scary, but he's this big evangelist. And like his first sentence out of his mouth is, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? And no one has ever asked me that question that I can remember. And I thought, man, I think so. Well, he could tell by my my reaction that I wasn't a Christian. Even though I grew up in a Christian church, a Christian home, an environment, he could tell I wasn't a Christian. And he wanted me to take take my time figuring that out first before I could take an interest in the daughter. But that self-righteousness I struggled with for a full year. Am Am I bad enough to go to hell? I mean, compared to my friends, <clears throat> I was a pretty good kid. And I really, that, it was a year of, am I lost enough and bad enough to go to hell? And it was at the very end of that year where I compared myself to God's standards. I had fallen way short of his glory. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And I had to put myself in that. My self-righteousness had to be put aside. And I was guilty for, for God. And I made my way back to uh, my friend's house, the parents, and they led me to Christ that night. For the first time in my life at 16, I realized Christ died for me. That he died for me and for my sins and I can go to heaven. And I knew for sure my salvation because of what Christ did. And so if that question is asked to me again, do you know for sure I'm going to heaven? I would say, without a doubt. And that's what you have to have. If you, there's, if you, like, if you say, like me, I think so, talk to us, man. You can know so. And that's what Mr. Fear told me that night. So it took me a year to get lost. But I found my greatest joy 
in Jesus. My number top, top joy in Jesus. And so I just think of us tonight. Where are you spiritually tonight? Where are you spiritually tonight? <clears throat> what was your, you don't have to say it a lot, but what was your top joy that you, you thought of at the very start of this message? And maybe Jesus was not even part of that scenario. It was not even on your radar that Christ did not make your list. And maybe because you've never entered into a relationship with Christ. And I thought of our you know, Joseph and Zechariah. Too good to be true. You know, you're a little too late. If you only knew my life story, you'd say it's a little too late for me. But with God, it's never too late. God extends that grace. And where sin abounded, God says, my grace can so much more abound. It's never too late. Or maybe you're not convinced he loves you or you, he wants a relationship with you. And you may say, <clears throat> you might have said, my job is my top joy. Jesus can do far better than that. You may say, my marriage is my top joy. Jesus can do far better than that. And I'm not saying it has to be either or. It can be both. But I, Jesus is far, far better than that. And I thought, how, how do I know that? I, just can, I can only share my own experience. That with him, I have a fresh start. I could have had a totally messed up past, but I can find forgiveness and healing with him, and I'm a new creation in Christ. Completely forgiven, 100% loved, unconditionally, at peace with God, lasting, secure relationship with my Savior. And I have a destiny beyond this life. Heaven is my home. I know that not because of my righteousness, but because of Christ. I don't fear death. I look forward to meeting my Savior in heaven. And on this side of heaven, he has given me a purpose and a reason for living. He has equipped me and all of us who know the Lord. He's equipped us to be able to minister to others in a way that blesses others and blesses us. He's given me a purpose in life. He has my back. He, he watches out for me. He takes care of me. He protects me. He carries me when I have no strength of my own. And he gives me a bigger family here and beyond these walls that truly care for me and love for me and that encourages and builds me up. And the list could go on and on and on. So just for the record, yeah, my job is great. I have two cats. They're, they're okay. I like my wife. Don't you love our cats? Yes, I love my yeah. You know, my marriage is great. All the, I could list all these joys, but it does not compare to the joy of Jesus. I mean, hands down, Jesus is number one by far. And I have a lot of these other joys are great, but Christ is far greater. So you might be like Mary trying to download this to Joseph, and, and I share this with you. Those who may not have ever come the, into the relationship with Christ, you say, I'm not convinced. And you know what? To be honest, I can't convince you. Just like Mary could not convince Joseph, it took a God moment. But would you be willing to pray God and say, if this is true, if this is true, open my eyes to the truth of Jesus' story and how it affects my life. At least be willing to pray to God, and God will show up and show you the truth on that. All right, so let's flip to those who are a Christian here. And maybe you said, yeah, Jesus is my top joy because that was the right answer as Christians should give, right? But you know down deep, maybe you're doing some things that aren't really spiritually healthy for you and you're, and you're not really walking with the Lord as you should be. And I was thinking of King David in the Old Testament where he got involved in some unhealthy things and got sidetracked into sin. He sees a naked lady. Next thing, he's committing adultery. Next thing, he has... Her, her husband killed. I mean, it's a pretty serious crime. He's confronted with this sin. And in Psalm 51, he, cry, in, he cries out into confession. He says, restore to me the, what? The joy of my salvation. And so sometimes we need a little restoration in our Christian walk and some transparency between us and the Lord and some honesty, maybe and some accountability with a brother and sister in Christ. God is more than willing to be your top joy. He wants to be that for you. So, in, so encountering Jesus brings joy. So co too good to be true, uh, finding joy in Jesus and the joy of encountering Jesus. So I'm going to give you some homework tonight. Can I give homework? I'm going to give homework. So this is it. And I want to share a story that kind of explains the homework I want to give you. So a few years back, my wife and I were in, and Justin, we were invited to this wedding reception in Mineola, Iowa, population 166. I mean, it is a small town. And many invites went beyond the, the little town there. And it was about a 45-minute drive. We got there about 
five, ten minutes late. And we were, everyone's getting seated. We go to sign the guest book, and my wife usually signs it because my handwriting is very bad. And, but they have, the guest book was these Jenga blocks. You write on these blo wood blocks this, in the game Jenga. And I just grab a block, and I start to write, and my wife goes, make sure they can read it. I mean, she's this teacher. She wants every letter legible. Mine's like, one line. Okay, so Scott and Debbie Nordstrom. I throw the block in the basket. I have no idea if it landed upside down. I mean, the basket was already full. I just threw it in there. We go sit down. So they're starting giving announcements, and we're dismissed, and we're going back out into the lobby where the guest book, in this case, guest blocks are. So the line goes right by there. So someone must have saw my name in there. And I'm um, getting my water, and I feel this tap on my shoulder. I turn around, and here's this lady that's probably in her 70s. She goes, excuse me, what is your name? I said, Scott Nordstrom. Her eyes light up. She's, she's found the person she's looking for. She goes, what is your mother's name? I said, Gloria. Her eyes light up. I said, she goes, what is your father's name? I said, Robert. She goes, do you know who I am? I said, hmm, I don't. I'm sorry. She said, well, your parents rented me an apartment. Now, this wasn't just last week. This is like 45 years ago. And they invited me to church, and they'd come by and pick me up. Now, I remember as a little kid going to the apartment, about 38th and Dodge, Blackstone area, and picking up some lady. I couldn't even tell you who it was. But I just remember she said, I remember as a little kid picking her up. She goes, I am a Christian today because of them. And she goes, just so happy. You see the joy overflowing and bubbling out of her that she met a Nordstrom, and I was the son of these parents that were important and led her to Christ. I thought, oh, that's a pretty cool story. I go down, I, I go sit down, and I, I tell my wife, Debbie, this is really kind of crazy what happened out there. Here's this lady, and she was just so excited that my parents were instrumental in seeing her come, become a Christian. So after the reception, she comes back over, and she goes, can I give you a hug? And she just gave me this biggest hug because she was so thrilled and still rejoicing in her salvation that someone took the time to share Christ with her. 45 years ago, the joy of Jesus was still real. And so here's my homework. <clears throat> well, actually, before I get this, so this is pretty cool. I am studying this portion. See, I'm going to give you guys homework. And Ali Farhadi calls, who used to be in Omaha, now lives in East Coast, North Carolina, somewhere, literally calling the same day. Scott, this is Ali. Oh, Ali, how you doing? I haven't talked to him for a while. He goes, hey, today is my 10th spiritual birthday. And I'm saying, Lord, what should I do? He goes, I'm going to call the people that were instrumental in seeing me come to Christ. And you know what, Scott? Ten years ago, uh, when we were standing on the sideline and watching Justin play flag football, you shared the gospel with me. And you were instrumental in seeing me come to Christ along with others. And I wanted to call you and just say thank you for doing that. I said, Ali, this is kind of bizarre because I'm literally studying, going to give this homework to Providence. And you're actually doing the homework even before you're even asked. I, I wouldn't have asked him anyway. But he's a long ways away. So I thought that was pretty cool. All right, so here's your homework, if you're willing to take it on. Go back, text, go to coffee, call somebody. Or a lot of times it's more than one person that was inter instrumental in seeing you. So you want a joy moment for 2020 when 2020 didn't pass out a lot of joy moments. This will be a joy moment for you. If you go back and just thank the person or people that was instrumental in leading you to Christ. I had a joy moment with Ali that, on that phone conversation. And I went back and talked to the person that was instrumental in leading me to the Lord, and we had a joy moment, and a little tear came in her eye. And just so thankful for the ones, and it actually encouraged you probably to share Christ, if nothing else. And so that's your homework, if you're willing to take that on. Just say thank you. It doesn't have to be any elaborate text, coffee, whatever it is. Thank the one who was instrumental in seeing you saved. And so tonight, finding joy in Jesus, too good to be true? Yeah, maybe it is, but it's true. The joy of encountering Jesus so may we all enter into God's joy story. All right, let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful for these stories that when we really stop to think about it, that they're hard to believe. To see you perform miracles with the gift of children and the joy that Jesus brings uh, to us. And Father, we are so thankful that you brought many here tonight into that story of Jesus, and that, Father, we are, in a sense, leaping for joy for our salvation. And so we thank you for Christ, 
And Father, we do pray for any here tonight that may have not entered that joy. May they see that joy in us and may they long for that and want it in us. And so I just pray for them that they too would have their eyes of understanding opened to the joy of Jesus. And so use these, these words, Lord, to minister to us. And Father, we are thankful for the ones that uh, stepped into our life to present Christ and that through them our eyes were opened to our greatest joy. So we thank you for that in your son's name. Amen.